snowboarder Anna Gassa wrote sports history with this triple somersault. Find out how she did it later in the show. Hello and welcome to Euromax. I am Evelyn Sharma and I look forward to bringing you the most exciting culture and lifestyle reports from around Europe as one of the hosts of the show Euromax here in Berlin. A few words about me. I was born in Aschaffenburg near Frankfurt. I'm half German, half Indian, and for the past 10 years, I have been traveling around the world as an actress and model. Currently, I live in Mumbai in India. So if you like Bollywood movies, then you've probably seen me in one role or the other on the big screen. And then, just just na wo cheez ki hai, wo apni drink ka ek sip lega. Cool? Chalo, very good. Working in front of the camera has been part of my life for quite a while. And our first story today is about how women are shown in advertising. The image of women in this field has changed a great deal over the decades. So let's embark on a kind of photographic journey through time that is currently being shown at an exhibition here in Berlin. The famous fashion photographer Horst P. Horst created this image in 1939. It's the oldest photo in the Women on View exhibition. 20 years later, commercial photography was getting bolder and experimenting more and more with feminine charms. In 1968, West German top model Verushka combined sexy and self-confident, presenting creations by Yves Saint Laurent. With each passing decade, advertising notched up the female erotic. Which products they were meant to sell was secondary. Women have always been used to advertise products. And in fact, it still works. Back when most women were housewives, they were in charge of buying products, whether intended for them or for men. Today, we live in a sexualized society, and we have lots of sex in the movies and music, not just in the advertising. So our ideas of beauty are linked to images of women. From the very start, advertising has utilized beautiful women to sell products. All that's changed is the way they're presented. In the 1990s, top models like Naomi Campbell dominated advertising. Their sexiness made them icons of style. Canadian photographer Michel Perez lives in Paris. He's been working in advertising for many years. His stock and trade are commercial photos of women in underwear, such as this one for a French company. They're meant to jog the imagination without becoming disreputable. What is sexy is a really fine line, you know, between going overboard and staying really, uh, you know, within the parameters of good taste. But I have my own view of women, and so I've been trying all my life to actually put forth that view, which is, you know, to not abuse women, to really respect them. Today, it's not enough for a model to be sexy and scantily clad. Commercial photography depicts a lifestyle, pitching the brand name almost in passing. The women are so beautiful, what else do you want? It's supposed to be a bit provocative to catch your eye, otherwise it'd be boring. Its shape and its movement, I mean, look at some of the pictures, it's so playful. It's fascinating. <laughs> Eroticism and advertising always go well together, I think. Most of the 160 photos and advertising posters in the Berlin exhibition were made by men. In this field, women artists are still rare. One exception is Hamburg photographer Karin Chikesi. She's numbered among Europe's leading women photographers since the 1960s. I think women have a different approach to women because they identify with each other and take a far more critical eye than men do with women. So in that sense, I'd say the photos women take of women are different. 
Over the past 80 years, advertising has shown more and more skin. But now the trend seems to be reversing. As photographer Armin Morbach sees it, the gratuitous use of nudity has now produced the exact opposite. Nudity is necessary for a normal perspective. I think it'll take this kind of shakeup for us to see that it's always been there. Things have become extremely prudish again. In the 60s and 70s, people talked about what was provocative. But now, with Instagram and all the restrictions, we don't know what breasts look like anymore. We have no idea how to present someone in the nude. The exhibition Women on View will run in Berlin until the end of April. When top chefs work their culinary magic, it can get pretty loud. But that doesn't really matter, because the guests usually don't hear what is going on in the kitchen anyway. When it comes to the dinner that we are going to have right now, it's quite different. Because in this case, all the cooking noises come together to form a culinary symphony. A chef taking a relaxed approach to his work. He's not distracted by the drummer or the other three musicians. That's because in this show, in the French city of Rouen, the chef is also making music with his kitchen tools. I feel more like a chef, but I'm also a musician. Actually, I'm both. The creative force behind the musical dinner concept is saxophonist Magalon Vidal. The project was inspired by her own life experience. I grew up in a restaurant. It was owned by my grandparents. I always found the restaurant noise fascinating. That's why I got involved with this project. I wanted to play around with sound. And I also think it's exciting to use restaurant ambiance as part of the choreography. Vidal wants to make people more aware of the connections among the senses. Hearing, taste and smell. And to create a kind of edible music. The chef cooks while the musicians perform. The music is composed so that it can take into account the working rhythms of the chef and the food. That's why the dish is always the same, and the music and the outline are based on it. Claudius Tortorici prepares most of the food for the 100 guests attending the show. The main course is a bourride, or fish stew, a popular dish in southern France. It's made with octopus meat, leeks, onions and potatoes. Even as he's preparing the food, the chef gets into the rhythm of the show. I always hear a kind of music when I'm working in the kitchen. Everything you touch, whether it's the dishes or a pot on the stove, makes a certain kind of musical sound. When I'm making french fries, for example, the noise reminds me of applause. So when I fry something, I turn around and take a bow. Time now for the second part of the show. The meal, which has its own unique sounds. The musicians now double as waiters and provide the guests with food and drink. Just about every show is sold out. You can actually hear the meal being prepared. And there are no wrong notes. It's all music. 
It reminds me of the sounds you hear while you're in the kitchen. La Tentation des Pieuvres is a show that sounds as good as it tastes. The first 100 years of the Bauhaus School is being celebrated here in Germany this year. The revolutionary movement has influenced many areas of life, from design to art and architecture, of course. Above all, the 1930s buildings in the clear and minimalist style have had a lasting influence on the way modern homes look to this very day. The Bauhaus movement left its mark all over the world, including where I live, in India. And here in the German capital, Berlin, you can even find fashion that has been influenced by the Bauhaus principles. Minimalist fashion that is also elegant. Linear, geometric concepts inspired by buildings like this one in Berlin, designed by Bauhaus architect Walter Gropius. Jennifer Brachmann, who studied architecture and fashion design, combines both elements in her fashions. Her work has been influenced by Bauhaus principles. The clarity of the designs, the principles and the overall approach allows you to create so many different variations. The Bauhaus architects essentially dismantled a structure and then put it back together again in a completely new way. Jennifer Brachmann does the same thing, using various elements of classic clothing. So what we have are two components that are not just side by side. They flow together to create something new. This fashion item was created by combining parts of a shirt and a dress coat. Jennifer loves to create fashions that surprise. At first glance, this looks like a separate shirt and a waistcoat on a hanger. Actually, the two pieces are sewn together. So it's one item. And from the back, you can see that it's a shirt. As a student, she founded the Brachmann label that she now runs with her husband, Olaf Kranz, in Berlin. At first, she designed only men's fashions and won high praise for them at Berlin Fashion Week. Now, she's also a welcome guest at the Paris Prêt-à-Porter shows, and she's expanded her business to include women's fashions, always true to the minimalist Bauhaus tradition. Why are sweet, playful fashions assigned to women and powerful designs to men? We should have got past that. The creative forces at Bauhaus wanted to change the world with their form follows function principles. Bauhaus designs still impress 100 years on. Jennifer Brachmann is trying to change the ephemeral world of fashion in her own way. For example, our sustainability concept is also an aspect of design. It creates interesting styles that will stay interesting for a long time to come. Whether it's concrete and glass or fabric, some forms never go out of style. Talking of perfect form, Anna Gasser delivers just that on the slopes. Because this Austrian powerhouse is a top snowboarder. Nobody's jumps are as cool and spectacular as hers. And in 2018, Anna was the world's most successful female snowboarder. She excels in the acrobatic disciplines, big air and slope style. However, she has actually celebrated her greatest successes out of competition. And these are images which simply take your breath away. Anna Gasse wrote snowboarding history with this cab triple underflip in November 2018. Three, 
No woman's ever accomplished it before. Once you've jumped, there's no going back. Thank God I had enough control in the air, and I knew as soon as I had jumped that it would be fine. Ana Gasa is currently the most successful female snowboarder in the world. At the Olympics and the World Championships, she has catapulted herself to the snowboard elite with a lot of effort and passion. If you don't like doing something, you won't be good at it. You need a certain mentality because you have to try out a trick without training and without knowing how safe it is. Nobody holds you and there aren't any mats, so you need to take the plunge. You need mental strength and the courage to go for it. Gasa participates in more competitions than any of her rivals. Here she is at the Snowboarding World Cup in Kaischberg in Austria. I think I'll have butterflies in my stomach. I go over my run in my head. I visualize everything step by step. It's important to concentrate on everything in the right order. The coach for the Austrian national snowboarding team is proud of Anna, who's been named Austria's Sportswoman of the Year twice in a row. And her fellow competitors admire her too. It's easy to get jealous when someone is doing as well as Anna, but I think I've been friends with Anna for a long time and I've seen how hard she works and she really deserves all the results she's been getting lately. When she wants something, she really wants it and gets it. And she does a lot to achieve it. She expects a lot of herself, and she's not satisfied with being better than most of the women. She really strives to be better than the men, too. Anagasa's partner, Clemens Milauer, is also a snowboarder. As a member of the Austrian national men's team, they go on tour together. He's not quite as successful as she is, but he's always close by with his camera. We're not in competition at all. Of course, if I say to her that I don't think she can do a certain trick, she'll be even more motivated to show me that she can. She's always happy when she manages to do something she set her mind on achieving. And that happens a lot. Anagasa grew up in a village in southern Austria. In her younger years, she was keen on gymnastics, when she discovered her passion for snowboarding at the age of 18, she packed her bags and went to the U.S. for a year. Snowboarding is especially popular there. From then on, her career really took off. She always posts her wins on social media. And it's not only for fun. Sponsors watch how many clicks athletes get. On the one hand, it's great because you can show yourself as you want to be seen, because the media just write about you or show you the way they want. On social media, I can show myself as I choose, without anyone else having a say in it. Sometimes, she shows another side of herself. But she gets most clicks for her posts of her spectacular jumps. Anagasa has her sights set on even more successes for the future. I don't set myself any limits, because otherwise I won't improve. I haven't reached the height of my career as a snowboarder yet. And that's why I keep going. Very impressive. You can see even more spectacular jumps by Anna Gasser on our YouTube channel. And of course, more exciting stories as well. Visit us at youtube.com slash DW Euromax. When our reporter Hendrik Welling mingles with ice artists and tries his hand at a frozen sculpture, it's for a good reason. Hendrik regularly visits exciting places that hold a very special record for our Euromax series called Europe to the Max. This time, he is traveling to Sweden to check out the world's oldest ice hotel.
We're doing 50 kilometers an hour in what feels like minus 50 degrees Celsius on what looks like a snowy road. But it's actually the frozen Torna River, source of the building material for the ice hotel. It's located in the Swedish part of Lapland, about 200 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle in the village of Jukosferi, population around 650. But every winter, it accommodates around 60,000 guests. Among them, Euromax reporter Hendrik Velling. The visitors come from near and far to spend the night in the Ice Hotel, the first of its kind in the world. Arne Berg is the creative director of the hotel, which has to be rebuilt every October. A few weeks earlier, it was like really... This is actually a big art expo, the Ice Hotel, and every year is unique. We never repeat, we never copy. We don't even copy ourselves. It's a fantasy world in ice. Each room has a different theme, designed by artists from all over the world. The guests themselves can try their hand at sculpting ice in a special workshop. That's it. It's not too bad, right? The DW logo in ice. Time now to meet 71-year-old Yngve Bergqvist, a local hero in Jukosjervi. He was the one who first came up with the idea for the ice hotel. It all started in 1989 when he opened an ice art gallery, and some guests stayed there overnight. In the beginning, we, we had this igloo with a small bar, mm -hmm. and uh, we made some uh, small beds also inside there and had some ice art. And then uh, people stayed inside our cottages here, and uh, then uh, I invited them to stay overnight in, inside, and they were so enjoyed of that. The project gained momentum, and in 2016, he created a permanent ice hotel. This is the first ice hotel year round. Here is it, minus five degrees, even if it's 30 degrees warm outside. In winter, it often sinks to minus 30 degrees Celsius here. Tour guide Jo Sakvik takes a group of hardened hotel guests out to look for the famous northern lights. What you want is a really, really dark spot where there's no electric lights at all. You want to keep away from looking into your phone or anything like that. It takes about 30 minutes to get your dark vision going for real. So being out there and really pushing it a bit, that's how you're going to get the, the best northern lights. Time to head off into the darkness. After about 45 minutes, the group reaches a good viewpoint. And there they are, the northern lights. Time now to get back into the warm, or at least somewhere not as cold, to settle down for an icy night's sleep. To make sure the guests don't get frostbite at minus five degrees Celsius, they get thorough instructions on how to stay warm. Time for bed. Good morning. The next morning, Hendrik Velling awakes to a nice hot drink. I slept surprisingly well last night, and it was much warmer than I expected it. And I would, at one moment at night, I woke up and I put my head out of my sleeping bag, and I was like, oh my God, it's really freezing cold. Got back into my sleeping bag and slept soundly for the rest of the night. Hendrik won't be able to sleep in the same room next year. In April, it will melt and return whence it came to the Torna River. Not only is the Ice Hotel one of the coolest places to stay, it's also sustainable. That makes me feel cold just looking at it. And that's all from us for today. But you can shorten the waiting time until the next show by taking a look at our homepage or joining us on Facebook. There you can also find everything about our current online draw. So don't miss your chance 
to win a fantastic Euromax wristwatch. But for now, thanks for joining. I'm Evelyn Sharma and I'd be delighted to see you again next time. Until then, take care and bye-bye.